This is the second in a series of three, chapter two in Growing Your Own Tomatoes. If you missed chapter one, this is the link you can find for the YouTube uh, presentation of that. That session dealt with a great deal of talking about selecting the various types of tomatoes and also starting from seed. This session is dealing more with helping you as you are picking out a tomato plant from the nursery. It might be a little late to start from seed. Here's the timeline for the next two tomato. Today's deals with tomato varieties, managing the growth via potting up a very important technique and getting ready to plant them out in the garden. We aren't really going to talk about putting them in the garden per se, except getting them ready. In May, on May 3rd, we'll talk about how you plant them into your garden and carry through for the summer with understanding good cultural practices and management to prevent disease or pest and how to have a successful harvest. We have a lot of objectives, so let's get started. First of all, what are the tomato varieties? You haven't picked it yet. We're gonna to try to help you recognize what would you would like in your garden for your needs. There are over 10,000 varieties of tomatoes, so it can be a little daunting. Secondly, how do you choose a good tomato start if you're buying one at the nursery? What, what to look for? Which tomatoes are recommended for cool versus hot climates? As we see climate change, it's important now to be aware of what you're putting in, will it do well? How to pot up a seedling. That's a secret that those who grow tomatoes successfully know how to use. When and how to be ready to plant the tomato start in the garden. It's important to know because too early can be a real problem. What are the techniques for growing successful tomatoes in a container? Many of you won't have the garden spot, so we'll talk about growing them in containers. And you may wanna know what neighbors in your garden, what other plants might be of help or hindrance in the growth of your tomato. So we'll talk a little bit about good and bad companion plants. There may be some early problems that occur with your tomato start. We'll help talk about how to address that. And also to talk about the function of rotating to, uh, your crops. So first of all, a brief discussion of uh, how to pick your tomato. One of them is to consider how much space you have and how, do you, how and when do you want to harvest them. So the two uh, differentiating kinds of tomatoes are the determinate, which is, uh, easier for to grow in a pot. It's shorter and bushy. The entire crop will grow and ripen in this about the short time, which makes it really good for canning. You can see here there's a, um, a probably a sun gold that's growing on a patio and how all of them have pretty well ripened at the same time. You don't have to stake it generally. It's good for growing in pots. That's the determinant. Now an indeterminate means it just continues to grow, whereas the determinant is producing and stopped the indeterminate is a vine will grow and grow and harvest over the entire season until either the frost or disease takes it. It does need to be staked. So you have to consider that in your garden. If you can have that much room, you do get a much higher yield. Maybe you want to consider, oh, what do I'm using my tomato for? Well, perhaps you want to just enjoy small little tomatoes you can pick and enjoy in your salads or, or uh, eating fresh. These are the generally the earliest to ripen. They're nice to have in your garden. And there's some varieties listed there, some of which have been developed by Oregon State. Um, and that is the cherry tomato. Then a little larger is the paste tomato, which is a meatier, less juice um, for good for sauces, drying and, and uh, salsas. Again, some of these are from Oregon State, uh, developed specifically for uh, this area. And also they do have a, a ability to be less um, t vulnerable to some of the uh, diseases. Then there's the slicer, which is a little larger tomato, uh, nice for putting in salads or on your sandwiches. Uh, these first four also are developed, have been developed by uh, Oregon State University. Then there's the champion beefsteak, which is a huge tomato usually, and uh, it's a generally the last to, to uh, ripen. It will require pretty vigorous uh, staking and caging and support because it gets to be a large plant and the tomatoes are very large. 
fun to grow though. Well, let's talk a little bit about the challenges in your environment. Uh, you may have a cooler climate or we may find you may find that you live in a climate that's now changing and, and there's more uh, cooler weather. The next three slides uh, there are listed uh, some varieties that are good for cool climates. And I want you to recognize that while this is a list that we have to go through kind of fast, this is the resource which you can access on the end of my production uh, in the resource list. So what you would probably do is download it, make some uh, notes, and then when you go shopping, see if you can find some of these. Uh, some of these that have been developed by Oregon State University, I think will be available in our area. Uh, Many of these you'll see are hybrids and determinants, and um, they are for short season gardens. There's another page of the cold climate tomatoes. Uh, I have grown this one. It's interesting if you look at it, it's originated in Siberia. So you know it's a plant that's been uh, learned how to be tolerant in cold weather. Again, Look at the names, Manitoba, Polar Baby. <laughs> it's a good clue, Siberia. Uh, referencing uh, tomatoes for you in a cold climate. Now, some of us are finding that we are having a hotter climate. And I think if you could imagine that you're gonna have a, a chance to try to maybe one, uh, one or two of each so that you have a, a chance to see if these are going to help you survive the weather changes that are occurring in our uh, in our climate now. So these, again, there's a resource there for you at the end of the program to access. But look at the names. Um, 4th of July, heat wave. Got a good indication that that's going to be a tomato that's going to manage the heat. Um, solar fire, spit fire, sun. Look at all the sun ones. Tomatoes for a hot climate. And here's our last page. Again. Encourage you to download it when you go shopping, see if you can find some of these to put in your garden. Well, you've got an idea of what you want to get, the kind of tomato you want to grow. Let's say you're going to go shopping for it. And now what are you going to look for when you want to purchase a tomato start? Because there are some things that are important to be aware of. You want it to have dark green leaves, not yellowing green leaves and stem. You want it to be as wide as it is tall. You can see this is a nice canopy here of leaves. And it shouldn't be much more than six inches tall because it'll have too much stem generally and a hard time in the nursery to develop the leaves it needs. You wanna make sure it's grown in an individual container and it looks like it's free of insects or disease. Now here's a plant you want to avoid. You can see how lanky and tall it is. Uh, it doesn't look healthy. The leaves aren't particularly very green. So don't buy that one. You also might be tempted to say, oh, here's a big, nice big one with flowers and fruit already, or at least flowers on it. You don't want to buy that one either, although it's tempting. And the reason is when you are going to plant that, you want the strength and the energy of the plant to go into developing roots. If it already has flowers on it, that's where the energy will be directed is producing more flowers and too early in the season. So think about root development as the most important thing for this new steep uh, plant that you have. You also want to avoid them if there's a lot of them in a big um, flat, because when you try to take them apart, you're going to be tearing the roots and that'll be a, a real shock as you transplant it. Here's another plant you want to try to avoid. Sometimes as they sit in the nursery for a long time, the roots will become uh, root bound. So what's happened here is the container that it was in, as the roots come and grow through the soil, they can't get any further. And so they go back up or inside or circle around. Now it's, you often can see it too, the roots coming down through, if you were to look before you take it out of the cell uh, tray. You can, if you get this, you can try to tease out these roots a little bit because right now when you put it in the soil to pot up, it's gonna be a root that's a little confused because it's been growing this way. So you can kind of tease it gently out a little bit as you put it in the new soil. So all is not lost, but if you can avoid uh, the root bound, that's a good idea. Well, where are you gonna buy your tomato plant? 
let me uh, suggest that you join us at the Spring Garden Fair, which is uh, an annual event of the Clackamas uh, County Master Gardeners. Um, it is at the uh, fairgrounds in Canby, Saturday, May 6th and Sunday, May 7th. And if you're wondering about where to find some of those fun tomatoes, you'll be able to find them there because there are uh, many vendors who have hundreds of kinds of tomato starts ready for you. In addition, you'll find uh, other vendors with other plants and garden tools and lots chance to talk with master gardeners about some good gardening ideas. So think about uh, May 6th and 7th, finding us at Gard Spring Garden Fair. So you bought your tomato plant, you're bringing it home. Now, how to care for it? Um, it's important between now and sending it out into the garden that you provide a protected environment for your start. And there's really four concepts to think about. The first one is warmth, keeping it warm. That would be the ambient temperature in your home or your greenhouse or atrium of 70 to 75 degrees. Now, this is no more long, no longer a time for a heat mat. If you have been using it for generating the seeds and germinating them, it's now time to take it off because as they grow uh, too long, you'll get elongated stems. Uh, the heat will drive that rather than producing nice leaves. So just the room in your house, 75 degrees, it does need to be warm. Second thing it needs is good light and about at least 12 hours a day. And sometimes that can be a challenge, but generally if you've got a good sunny window south facing or whether you're gonna have direct sunlight, you can easily grow your tomatoes in, a, in your house in the, in the sun. If you want, you can also use fluorescent lights or LEDs, which are a very nice way to control the light. The third item to consider in your protective environment is the hydration or watering your plants. We highly recommend what's called bottom watering. And that means that you're not gonna, even though this is quick and easy, grab the sprinkler and spray, it is not healthy, not recommended. Rather, we recommend soaking the roots with bottom watering. It looks like this, a container where you filled, put some few, a couple inches of water in it. Let's talk a little bit more about it, give more directions here. First of all, <clears throat> why bottom soak the seedlings? Well, it helps to avoid water on the leaves because water on the leaves can uh, increase the risk of a fungal growth. It gets water to where it's needed, which is the roots, uh, it, rather than just watering the leaves. Nice thing is it's a really efficient, easy way to fertilize your seedlings because you can put a water soluble uh, fertilizer into that pan of water and you fertilize the seeds with uh, water going right up into the roots. The plant is well hydrated and it is so thoroughly hydrated that you can reduce the number of times you have to keep watering the seedling because it's so thoroughly, all the soil is, is uh, moistened. So how to do it? Two to three inches of tepid water with the fertilizer if you want, uh, one, maybe one time a week when you're doing that and you dissolve it into a large pan or tray, put your plants in and allow them to soak up the water until you see that the, the soil is saturated. Take it out, drain it well, and return it back to your protected environment, whether you had it on the windowsill or wherever. The fourth item for your protected environment is the air. So we had warmth and light and watering and then air. So good circulation is very much needed. Uh, and this can be accomplished with just a, a little fan that blows, or maybe you just walk by the plants periodically through the day and brush your hand lightly with them. The importance of the air is that will uh, prevent the stem from getting really long and leggy, and it'll reduce the risk of fungal growth and results in um, a better stem, a healthier stem. Now, I mentioned LED lights, and there was a bit of conversation in my first uh, webinar about that, and I'm going to uh, explore that a little bit further with some more information. So we know from uh, the light that there are different lengths of light waves and those different lengths encourage different specific plant behavior. So I've listed them here, red and orange yellow help the plants to flower, white and green to green helps expands the foliage and blue violet promotes root and leaf growth. Well, you're gonna say, do I have to buy three different lights? 
to get each wavelength. Not generally, you can buy what's called a grow light and that'll offer the full spectrum of the, of the wavelength. And it, it looks like, might look like this. So if you want to invest in LEDs, uh, the grow light would, is a nice way to make sure that the, your plants do get that amount of light. Well, whether you've put it in your windowsill or whether you've got it uh, in your greenhouse or just on your uh, counter in some sunlight, you, when your plant looks like this, it's time to pot it up. So you're gonna have it uh, look, pull it, maybe pull out one or two of yours to see if the roots start to look like this, because if they do, you can see that they've wound all the way around, they've exhausted the soil that is available to them and it's time to pot them up. Now, this is an interesting plant because this is planted in a soil block. And I mentioned that in my first webinar. Uh, the advantages of a soil block is you don't have any kind of a container that plastic, the container that surrounds it. This is the container itself. And when the roots grow out, they become what we call air pruned. They don't grow any further in the air. They just stop and they just stay there at the edge of the, of the block until you're ready to transplant them and then they're ready to go. So it, it transplants very easily without the shock of, uh, of a plant that's been inside of a cell, plastic cell. But anyway, it looks the same as you can see here, contrasting them. Um, they're about the same height and they look healthy and they both of them are ready to pot up. So potting up, very important technique. Seedlings are maybe two to three inches tall. For those of you who started it from seed, uh, it's about four weeks after that. Then you're going to move that to a larger plant, a pot, four inch pot to avoid getting the pot bound plant. Then when it grows to be this height, then you're gonna pot it up again. Now you may find the nursery plant that you purchased is already this tall. In that case, then you need to pot up uh, to uh, develop the roots. You want to pot it up again at least two or three times before you put it in the garden. Important after you repot it, uh, try to give it a bit of a, a break from uh, direct sun so that it can recover, especially if it's um, from a cell. It's not such a concern with a soil block one. So let's see what it looks like. It's maybe a little bit uh, easier to see with the, with the pictures. So I'm going to take the bottom leaves off and I want to plant this deep into a pot. I'm looking for improving the roots. So when I do that, I put it deep and then fill it up with soil. And we'll talk about the fact that tomatoes have adventitious roots. Now that means that the plant, when it's put into the soil, is a good way to describe it and see it. It's planted deep in the soil and you fill up clear up to the top and the roots are gonna start developing here. I'm sorry, the roots are gonna start developing here from the stem because of adventitious roots. And let's look at it here, another way to see it. So the soil, when it comes in contact with the stem, the stem will produce roots from that portion. So if you think about the fact that the more roots your plant has, the healthier your plant is. Now, interesting here, this plant has gotten so tall that it's needed to be laid down and that's fine. It works just fine. You gently lay it down. You might do this in your garden as well with the trench planting, which we'll talk about with the third webinar. But look at all those roots that have developed because I have repotted it each time. This one probably has been repotted two or three times, all those healthy roots. So each time you pot up, the plant becomes healthier. So, okay, how do we do it? What are the steps? First of all, you wanna soak the seedling because you want the soil surrounding the roots to cling to the roots. If it's dry and the soil falls away, that's a problem, the roots are exposed and you could damage them. So soak them first, take away the lower leaves, use the potting mix, a nice clean potting mix and put it deeper into the pot. After you've done that, you want to fertilize it and water it. The fertilizer recommended would be about a fourth strength of what you would normally use for a large plant. And then put it in a protected place uh, to provide that protection for its continued growth. Well, you've got your plants potted up. They're doing well. You're watching them. So let's take a minute and say, okay, we want to eventually get it out in the garden. So let's talk about getting the garden ready because we can do that while our uh, seedlings are growing.
First thing is, let's look at the soil condition, where to plant, and what do I need at the planting time? So we're going to be kind of preparing ourselves. We want to have the soil at the right uh, pH level. For a tomato that is generally a little acidic, 6.2 to 6.8, and you're going to say, how do I know that? We welcome you and encourage you to bring your, uh, you can bring up to four samples of, uh, small samples of soil from your garden uh, at to the Spring Garden Fair. That is a free service we offer, soil testing. We want and you, it could be other uh, parts of your garden too, just to check for your tomatoes for sure to make sure that you've got this level. And we teach afterwards, uh, when you give you the results, we teach about uh, how to amend the soil so that uh, it will be what the level that you need for your crop. Um, if you don't have a soil test available, uh, the rule of thumb is to apply some fertilizer, generally a uh, base universal level of 10, 10, 10 per 100 square feet. And you want to work the fertilizer into the soil two to three weeks before planting. What does the soil look like? Well, if you've watched some of the other webinars, you know that we've taught that when the soil looks like this, it's not a good time to go in and, and uh, work it. You can destroy this the and damage the soil structure when it makes a, a hard pack like that. Rather, you want it to look loamy and loose like that. The challenge with tomatoes is it not only needs to be nice and loamy, but it needs to be warm, 60 degrees or warmer. So how do we get that? Well, one of the ways is you can pre-warm the soil if you want. Put out a plastic mulch. Now, there's several different kinds of uh, mulch, plastic mulch. Uh, there's the clear, which if you put it down, it'll warm the soil the fastest, but it'll also allow the sunlight through, which means you're going to be out growing weeds. So a black or red mulch, plastic mulch, will warm the soil and block the weeds. And there are some who found that uh, the red Plastic mulch uh, increases the yield and will ripen the fruit faster. And of course, if you have a raised bed uh, that's above the grade, uh, that's also a, a nice way your soil will be warmer there from the sides. Uh, so that's a nice way that you can have warmer soil ahead of the normal garden, open garden. Well, here's a picture of a gardener who's uh, warmed it with plastic sheeting. Now you'll notice that it's pulled tight and anchored here if you have air spaces in that, it's going to be an insulation and prevent the warming of the soil. So, so secure it down tight. The interesting thing is, uh, it's been found that if it's on a nice sunny day, that the uh, solar energy will warm the soil by as much as about 16 degrees Fahrenheit on one day. So a plastic mulch is a nice way to consider if you want to get your soil warmer. Well, your seedlings are still growing in your protected environment, but you can get out and do some prepping in the garden for eventually putting them in the soil. Um, you, if you get a chance and the soil is workable, you can turn it under and around for about 10 to 12 inches deep, add some organic matter, two to three inches. And again, make sure that you've got a chance to have your pH uh, tested and you're within range for that plant. Well, where are you gonna plant them? Location is very important. A tomato plant needs a minimum of eight hours of sun. It needs to have this soil loamy, well-drained, and it needs to be protected from the wind. However, you don't want it in a low spot because there'll be no air circulation there. And the other problem is the moisture may collect and puddle and not drain well. So those are places, those are ways to look at your garden and say, what, what do I need for this plant to, to be healthy? Watch the location. Now, some of you may say, I don't have a space like that where I can find those types of uh, requirements. So in which case, you can grow a tomato on your balcony or patio, especially the, uh, the cherry tomatoes do well. Now, what you should do is, Get yourself a, the pot that you can use. It should be four to five gallons in size because the tomato has a very large root system. It doesn't really matter what it's made of. It can be a terracotta, it can be a metal, it can be a wood. Yeah, the, what, is, what matters is that it allows for good drainage. That's what's the most important thing there is not the size, but that you can water it and the water will drain well.
It should have six to eight hours of sunlight if possible. Cherry tomatoes can get by often with just six, but uh, if you've got a sunny spot, the better the tomato will be. But it is possible to grow tomatoes well in a garden, in a pot container. Well, some containers can be a problem if you uh, have too many in one container or you have too small of a container, too many here, too small. Maybe you've added too much water or you can't got it where there's enough light. So let's look at these requirements again. Too small of a container, maybe too much water or not enough water, or maybe you're watering the foliage of the plant, which isn't good. So each one of these, too many, not enough light or failure to fertilize also, you consider that within that pot is a limited amount of soil that's not being, that's been utilized by the plant. Excuse me. And so you need to make sure that you're adding fertilizer probably more than you would if it were in the garden. Now you've been potting up and potting up and now you're saying, when can I start planting in the garden? Well, my plant is now six to eight inches, six to 10 inches tall. And the soil temperature is now warmer. So maybe I could put it in the ground. I might want to add some protection. So I considered that. The nighttime temperatures are above 50 degrees. And I don't know if I want to though, because I find that if I'm not here, I've got inadequate soil and air temperatures. I'm just going to keep potting it up because I'm not trusting the weather right now. Because remember, every time I keep it in a protected environment and pot it up, I can sink the plant deeper and the roots will grow stronger. So there's no rush to get that out into the garden. In fact, well, here's a checklist. My garden soil is prepped and ready. Daytime temperatures are pretty good. Nighttime temperatures are not bad. Ah, uh, I've got my tools ready. Am I ready to go? No, wait. One more technique we've got to talk about. Hardening off, very important procedure before you get ready to put that tomato out in the garden. Hardening off means that you are taking your plant, which has been in a wonderfully cozy, comfy environment, and you're gonna prepare it before you put it out in the garden. Just think about going from your comfortable home 70 degrees and you're putting it out into the garden in the soil and the environment that's uh, out there and that it's a real shock and so in order to avoid that shock which can you know can de uh, damage the growth of the plant right off the bat and kind of stunt it so let's 10 to 14 days before you think you're going to put it out in the garden start acclimating it which means hardening off you want to start very slowly just a little bit one hour at a time increasing it try to keep it out of direct sunlight and you increase it up to a day now it's very important that you monitor it for water and leaf health because the uh, plants will will lose moisture faster outside so make sure that you're ke keeping an eye on them for water final step if uh, if the weather allows it you want to leave it out overnight for a few days just to see if the temperature will be uh, adequate and to see how they do uh, you want to make sure that you're also looking at your warming, the planting area, that it's nice and warm too. Well, something to consider though about, um, about the hardening off is if you, again, they lose water, so you need to frequently water it. But if the temperature drops during that time that you've got them out and it's below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you need to bring it indoors. Tomatoes can experience a chilling injury which can delay the growth and cause this incident called cat facing in some of the early fruits that develop. So you want to avoid that chilling. Let's talk just a minute about uh, degree days. This is a uh, in response to some studies that Oregon State has done to help growers understand when plants grow, what causes, what temperatures are needed for plants to grow adequately and optimally. So if we talk about degree days, the, prob the issue is really to help us understand why I shouldn't plant out in the garden too early, because that's always a temptation, especially when our seedling starts to look big and healthy and we have a few warm days, we wanna put it out in the garden. But the study for degree days, what it does is it measures the uh, 
accumulation of the air temperature and uh, or basically what what creates a growing day. So the concept of heat units is mentioned. Now the heat unit can be figured by taking the average daily temperature. That means I take the high and the low, add them together, divide by two for the average. And from that number, I'm going to subtract what's called the base temperature. And for a tomato, the base temperature is 50 degrees. That means it won't grow below 50 degrees. That's the base temperature. Now, if my nighttime temperatures are low, we may not have enough heat units for some uh, for sufficient growth. Again, I this I have listed this in my resources. It's a very interesting article, and it also uh, talks about other vegetable gardens that you may be interested, vegetable plants that you may be interested in putting in your garden, and uh, it figures the, uh, the the degree days need for those plants. So, well, how does that affect my tomato planting times? So again, here we go, a base air temperature, which was the average, uh, the, which is, is, is the d amount of uh, warmth needed for growth in a tomato. So here we go with the average temperature. And let's pick a, a day uh, in late May when we might have a high of 50 and a low, a high of 80 and a low of 50. So the average then is 65. And from that average, we subtract the base temperature of 50 degrees, which gives us, quote, 15 degree days. Now, what does a degree day mean? It means that we are going to figure that into the total degree days required for a certain stage of the plant. So here in the study they've done, here's a new girl variety of plant of tomato. And they say, how many degree days does it take for us to see the first flower? They have studied and find it takes 498 degree days to get the first flower. Well, if I have 15 degree days with this type of a temperature, average temperature, it's going to take 33 days for me to have the first flower. Interestingly enough, if you take some of the later developing and uh, ripening tomato plants, which indigo rose is one, the first flower there requires 590 degree days or 40 days of actual growth. So it's important to think about because the degree days will affect the fruiting rate as well as the growth rate of your plant. Well, let's take another hypothetical here. So I looked in, in early in May when somebody might be tempted to put the tomato plant in. Oh, it's a nice sunny day. We have a high of 70, but it's kind of cool at night, 45. The average is 57. If I subtract the base temperature, remember that was the temperature of 50, which was the plant at which uh, the temperature at which a tomato needs to grow. Subtract that from the average, I get seven degree days. If early girl requires 498 heat units or degree days to flower, if it doesn't get much warmer than that, that could take me 71 days till I get to the first flower. Well, of course, it's not going to stay that cold, but I know that by putting it out when it's this temperature, I'm not going to have optimal growth. The cooler temperature increases the time for plant growth if I plant early in May. So as tempting as it is, don't put your plant out. You can use these formulas and uh, maybe keep track of uh, the temperatures and see what you're ending up with for degree days uh, as the weather improves. Well, what does all this mean? <laughs> it means that if you put your tomato out too early, it isn't gonna have enough degree days to really grow healthy. And when a plant is out there lacking the heat units, um, it almost looks kind of sad. It may languish and take time to recover from the exposure of the temperatures that were below the base, which is 50 degrees. The other risk is uh, that plant could be uh, susceptible to molding and rotting. So we want to avoid that. Well, we're not ready to put them out in the garden. The materials are... Uh, ready though uh, for us to gather and get ready so that when we do want to plant them let's have them ready and handy so the next webinar may 3rd we'll talk about actually putting them out in the garden but for now let's just gather materials so that we're ready so the first one is we need to have fertilizer and that ratio we'll talk about in a few minutes about why that's the best for our tomato production so we have fertilizer at hand. We're going to have gather some stakes because your plant needs to be supported as it grows. And you'll put the stake in the day that you plant it. 
Uh, the stake will keep it upright and you can use a lot of different materials, bamboo, metal, plastic, or wood. And you'll want to put some soft ties to attach to the plant with to the stake. You also will need cages. You have to have them both really to have your plant really uh, be safe and grow strong. Cages need to be very sturdy. Some that are sold are not sturdy enough. So look for a good sturdy tall tomato plant cage. It can be made out of wood or plastic piping or metal. You're gonna make sure that you've got your soil warmed and ready at 65 degrees. And if you want, you'll may want to put on some row covers or cloches, whatever you need for the protection of that plant. Have these items on hand and ready to go for when you're ready to plant in your garden. Other things to consider is how you're going to rotate the crop, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And if you want any companion plants to grow alongside. So let's go back and talk about the fertilizer, the first item on there. Tomatoes are incredibly heavy feeders you need to fertilize them. And Oregon State recommends this ratio, one to two to one, which means that the first number you see on a, a fertilizer bag is nitrogen. And you need nitrogen for growing foliage. However, you can see that the ratio there is lower. That's because too much nitrogen on a tomato plant when it's finally put into the ground can do a couple of things. You can end up with just this enormous amount of foliage and it also increases the susceptibility of blossom end rot. So you want to limit the nitrogen to just this ratio. What you do want are flowers and fruit. So the phosphorus, the second number, is the item you want to have higher in your in your fertilizer. And the third item is the potassium, and that's at a level a little bit lower. It helps with the roots, but the main thing is you're going to want to have uh, urging of flowers and fruit in the with the phosphorus. Uh, added in your in the fertilizer well with fertilizing you want to start way before if you can if the soil's workable by working compost uh, or a slow uh, a slow acting uh, fertilizer some of the natural ones organic ones at planting time you're going to put in about just a handful one to two ounces of the fertilizer we mentioned or bone meal, and you put that in each particular planting hole for each uh, each tomato plant. So here's the four items we talked about to gather fertilizer, stakes and ties. You might need some season extenders if you want to protect your plants and strong cages. Now, you're growing your plants, putting them in. We've been asked, are there good plants to plant around, good companion plants? Since as master gardeners, we are uh, always teaching from evidence-based materials and scientific studies, it's a little hard for us to grab a hold of a, a good scientific study, but there's a lot of good anecdotal evidence and common sense that helps us to understand that yes, there are good companion plants for tomatoes. Uh, it's hard to have a good scientific study because there's just too many factors that influence while your plants out there in the garden besides uh, the companion plant that's next to it. But this is a good list of herbs and flowers. Uh, basil's highly recommended to grow near your tomato plant. Uh, wonderful because its strong scent confuses or masks to deter insect pests as well as, as, well as the marigold flowers, some flowers uh, uh, that can attract beneficial insects. Then there's a lot of, of herbs that uh, repel aphids, beetles, and slugs. And some of these will also attract beneficial insects. So these are uh, good to uh, think about having them near or around your plants. Also vegetables uh, you can use for nitrogen fixing in your soil. And then more uh, plants that will mask the scent from insects as onion and garlic. Now, those are good companion plants. Is there a bad plant to have next to your tomato or around your tomato? And that's definitely true. The brassicas, Broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, and cauliflower bring insects and pests and can, and can reduce the growth of your tomatoes. So don't have them near. They're good to grow in your garden. Just don't have them near your tomatoes. Then consider the fact that there's a whole family of plants of which tomato is one called the nightshades. And those plants, eggplant, pepper, and potatoes uh, are going to be susceptible to the very same 
problems you're going to have with tomatoes, fungus, or bacteria. So that let's not have these growing right next to them or even in the same place that you're going to have them year after year. And we'll talk about uh, rotating your plants. So there are good and bad companion plants. Now, rotating the plants is a very uh, highly recommended for your uh, health of your plants. Why, why rotate? Well, it prevents depletion of the soil nutrients. For instance, the tomato is a really heavy eater of calcium. It's gonna deplete the calcium in the soil so that if you put it in, one year you might have a fine crop and the next year it might be okay. But if you put it in the same place three years or four years in a row, there's no way that you've been able to compensate for the amount of calcium it has drained from the soil. Be highly difficult to do. So you rotate it and put it in another part of the garden and then you can build back up the calcium or also the nutrients that are needed for another crop. So uh, it's highly recommended to do that. It also helps to maintain the soil structure. Think about planting um, carrots or beets uh, in the ground where you've got a root in the ground, kind of breaks up the soil a little bit. And so it helps you so that the soil structure stays nice and loose. And the best thing is when you rotate it, you prevent uh, the soil borne pests from getting a foothold. Now, what happens when if you're going to have a soil borne disease, it'll winter over and then you put the tomato back in in the very same place. And those little pests are all ready to grab on and say, yay, here's our second meal. And uh, if you keep doing that, those those soil borne diseases can get a real uh, foothold in the garden. And so it's time to rotate. Well, how do you do it? You avoid planting tomatoes or any of the family of crops. Remember we talked about the nightshades in the same location for three years. So if you can rotate it out and leave it so that you don't have a nightshade in the same place, any one of these tomatoes, peppers or eggplants or potatoes in the same spot, then that will eliminate or really highly reduce the risk of having any of those diseases that linger over. Now, sometimes it's very hard to rotate because you might say, I don't have that many spaces in my garden that meet the criteria for, for uh, circulation and sun and whatever. So here's some options. Uh, you could start using pots, or if you can't find another spot, you can just add some clean soil uh, to try and mix in. Or you might want to consider planting, if you have limited space, um, a grafted tomato because the grafted plant, the scion has put on a rootstock that is uh, very vigorous and resistant to a lot of soil borne diseases. So they're more expensive, but if you only have want to have one or two or them, three of them, you could do that. And then you don't have to worry so much about rotating the, your uh, tomato. Well, I want to talk a little bit about how to improve the soil and also get your tomato seedling healthy till it, uh, while it's growing inside in your protected environment. So I highly recommend the use of worm castings or worm tea. Look at all the things that it can do. Uh, it improves soil structure, it adds microbes, it release, has nutrients. Look at all the micronutrients that it adds and macronutrients. Um, it improves water retention ca uh, capacity. What I like to do is when I do a potting up is I'll do a top dressing right out right there on the soil. And I also like to make a tea from the worm castings and I use it as a foliar spray or it could be used as a, in the bottom watering, put it adding it in the water. So you say, well, how in the world do I make worm tea? Well, take a, I use a, a sock. And a, a natural fiber sock and you fill it up with the worm castings. Tie the end of it shut and then put it in a bucket of water. You're going to steep it overnight, keep it submerged. It, it when it's done, it should look like a wheat tea. And then you take the bag out, store the tea without a lid and use it within a week or two because the microorganisms that you have created in this tea or that are living there need oxygen and they won't last forever. They'll die after a while. But it's a wonderful foliar spray. When the plants start to look a little, uh, you know, less than great, it just perks them right up. You're gonna have some problems maybe that occur, large, largely it's due to nutrient deficiency. Um, you can always take a picture of your the leaf and and uh, contact the master gardeners helpline because they can kind of help you with diagnose it. And this one, just this particular example, uh, I've experienced in the past is a magnesium deficiency, and this the leaves become kind of yellow and brittle. 
And uh, what I did was made a foliar spray of magnesium sulfate. Probably could have avoided that if I hadn't started my seedling quite so early that year because they were in the pot a long time. And even though I potted them up, the leaves started to have some difficulty. But I also found that by adding a foliar uh, spray of weem tea that I've been able to avoid this problem now. Well, to summarize, we have talked about the various varieties of tomatoes. Determined, you have determined which are best for your garden based on how you want to use it and how you can grow it. How we prepare the garden bed and most important, potting up. Take advantage of adventitious roots. Transplanting and materials that you need as you're going to start thinking about getting them out to the garden. Be sure that we're using hardening off techniques and the consider rotation of the crops and also soil and plant enrichment. Hello. We're here to answer your questions. We've had several sent in and Priscilla's gonna lead us through them. Th Welcome Priscilla. And thanks to Carol and Shara for also answering questions. Yeah, there were a lot of questions coming in and uh, great topic and people are ready and willing to get their tomatoes out in the garden, but we really wanna set them straight about some of this stuff in chapter two. Um, one of them was about potting up. Can you give us an idea of if your plant is in a four inch pot, what size pot does it go up to? How, like, can I put that into a three gallon pot and just be done? It's tempting. Give me some then transitions. You'd be, all, you'd be all done. No, just remember that every time that you're gonna move that little plant a bit deeper, and if you were to go to a big three gallon pot, you can't put it very deep. It's not a very big plant. If it's in a if it's in a four inch pot right now, it might be up to ten inches tall. And even if you took some of the lower leaves off and put it down, you're not going to get it that deep. And the deep every time that you repot it up and consider doing it gradually. There, I saw several questions, and so this is a good one to bring up uh, for everybody to kind of reinforce it, Priscilla. The the more times you can repot it up, and gradually then the better it is. And, and let's say you're going to buy it at the Spring Garden Fair. Um, and there, by the way, there will be a link that will be sent out uh, when, the, when you get your uh, link out for this. There'll be some more information on the Spring Garden Fair. Um, when you get it, you're going to buy probably a six, four to a six inch high one and it'll largely would be in a four inch pot. I would say take it home, let it grow for a little bit and then uh, put it into um, maybe a six or seven inch pot. And then you can go from that into maybe a gallon pot and you've done it, you've done it twice and that should be pretty good. Um, at least two to three times, try to do that because each time you do, you're gonna get more roots. And remember we've said the health of the plant is determined by the health of the roots. And the more roots you can get. The tomato really gives us a, an advantage that many plants don't by having the uh, roots, the cells, the cells in the stem that become root cells. Great answer. That um, I think that answers a lot of people's questions. But it is tempting, I know, to just say, I'm just going to jump to a big pot and save some time. Right. No, don't be tempted to do it. Take the time to repot. Your plant will love you for it. Yes. Um, season extenders. There were talks about water walls and hoop houses or, or a high tunnel. That's yes. what I think. Um, and how does that factor into? Um, degree days. Um, so can you just give us a little bit of answers about, you know, the uh, use of those season extenders and degree days? Well, degree days are independent of whatever you've got your plants over. It's just, that's the way the heat, uh, the heat of the atmosphere is. But what you're doing with your season extenders um, is just providing a little more protection of the wall of water. As you saw the picture there of the gardener, she lives in Montana, which is, you know, does, it's a short season. And so that allows her to put her tomatoes out earlier. The one thing that I know that she has to watch, though, is when it does warm up, she's got to take those off. So I think you want to think of both the hoop houses and the and the wall of water or uh, a cloche, you know, there's some ways you can make your own little covers with uh, milk jugs, upside down milk jugs. Um, all of those are designed to just protect your plant during inclement weather. And when it gets warm, you've got to take those off or your plant will be, will be stressed with too much heat. 
right? And I also stressed that if there's any risk of frost, you know, yes. those those extenders are not really going to, not a hard frost anyway. So make sure you're monitoring, you know, when our last frost would be in your region. And I think there's a, a nice um, OSU uh, document on that. Right. Yep. All righty. Um, now, how about the importance of pH? I know that we um, have mentioned that people can go to the Spring Garden Fair, bring a soil sample, um, and I believe it's going to be in the 4-H building this year? Correct. Okay. So, um, May 4th from 9 to 5 and May 5th from 9 to 4. Explain again a little bit about pH and, and why that helps our our uh, tomato plants and all plants do well. Yes, right. Yeah. So if you think about your ground, that uh, the soil that has you put in nitrogen and you put phosphorus and whatever, uh, and you say this should be just what the plant needs, but if the pH is is too low, maybe it's acidic. Um, remember, tomato likes just slightly acidic, six point two to six point eight. So let's say you got it in a plant and a patch that you had blueberries and or strawberries, and that's a little more acidic soil. And you say, why aren't my tomatoes doing well? It is interesting that the pH, um, the level of pH allows the nutrients to dissolve and be able to take up into the plant. So if I have the wrong pH, I can have all the nitrogen or phosphorus in the, that plant needs, but it's not able to be dissolved because of the wrong pH. So uh, it locks it up. That's the main thing. That's the reason that we say start. If you're going to start with how do I have a good garden and how do I get my plants to grow, start with the right pH. Now, interestingly, when we've done the soil samples and the pH testing, people don't need to bring in a gallon of, of soil. Uh, usually three or four tablespoons in a Ziploc bag label the garden area that you are taking it from and maybe what you want to plant in there so that the master gardeners who are testing and counseling you can help you uh, understand whether you need to amend the soil and change the pH at all. Yeah, and I remember when I talked to one master gardener, like I was worried about my soil for my rhubarb and uh, I thought it was way too acidic and they have this really nice uh, booklet there and they can just look up the crop that you are planning to grow in that area and um, advise you on if, if the pH is in, a, in a, an acceptable range. So nice. um, yeah. That, that's it. It was a really great presentation, so much information, and um, there is a, going to be a link to um, this recording, and um, if you didn't get all your questions answered, please email us, and um, Amelia and I will try and get back to you in the next couple of days. Thank right. you, Amelia. Well, thank you, Priscilla and Carol and Cheryl, and, and thank you for attending, uh, and uh, happy gardening.